completely nervous, uh, but very, very excited about this moment. Come one more time, can you cheer for Ashley and Kaylin? <laughs> Making their commitment and getting baptized. Uh, they, will, they will never forget this moment, and it's very exciting that we get to be a part of that. Welcome to all of you online with us. If uh, you are starting to feel like you can kind of move around and get out with people, I, and for example, if you've been to Costco, you could come to church. I'm just going to say it like that, right? But I know for some of you, it's just, it's not possible yet. And so we're glad you're joining us online. But when you're ready, come and hang out with us. We're having a blast here. Uh, next week, we start a brand new series called Dear Friends. And we designed this for over the next 12 weeks, really. We're going to just kind of pick different letters in the New Testament where Paul writes to either a church or an individual. So, dear friends, that's the idea. And we're going to, it's kind of be like this, this big overview of, of that letter. Like, here's the picture, and then we're going to boil it down to one particular thing. Maybe whoever's speaking that weekend can share maybe their favorite verse or favorite passage from that one letter. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that. That starts next week. And uh, if, you have a, if you have a paper Bible and you like to write in your Bible, this would be a great series to do that with. So bring that with you. You can kind of follow along, make your notes as we kind of dig into each of those letters that we're going to work our way through. Um, tonight, we, we uh, uh, celebrate and conclude our series, uh, the, the Love Bank. The, I mean, sorry, The Love Bank. That's how Barry White would say it. For those of you old enough to know who Barry White is. Anyway, uh, we're so good, glad that you're with us. Let's just take a minute and pray, and we're going to dive into this, okay? God, thank you for your grace. Oh, man, we need grace in our relationships in our marriages, our family, our friends. Um, thank you, God, for showing us the way. And uh, God, for helping us throughout this series to learn what it means to really make more deposits and withdrawals and to really invest in the relationships we have. Teach us again tonight, one more time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this drunk, it's a great way to start a message, right? Anyway, this, this drunk crawls onto the bus and he's he just the only seat available is next to a priest. And the guy's just like, he, you can tell he's been going for quite a while. He's got like red lipstick all over his white shirt. He's got like half of a wine bottle in his pocket just kind of hanging out there. And he's, he's just had a time, I guess. And so he just doesn't look at the priest at all, just starts reading a newspaper. And then he puts the newspaper down. And he says, excuse me, sir. He goes, I got a question. He goes, how do, you, how do you get arthritis? And the priest, like seizing the moment, just says, well, it comes from loose living. It comes from running with wild women and having no, dis or no respect for humankind. Picks up the paper, just keeps reading. And the priest now feels a little guilty. He came on so strong, right? So he's like, excuse me. He goes, I I'm sorry, I came on a little strong there. How, how long have you had arthritis? And the guy says, I don't have it. I just was reading it. The Pope does. I want to thank my former Catholics for getting that one. <coughs> and most of you didn't get it. We'll explain it to you later. It's, it's all right. Hang in there with us, right? And here's the idea. We're talking about honesty this week. So the, the real kind of choice is like lies or love. And, and, and it's not always as easy as you think to tell the truth in relationships. But hopefully you're going to find out that it's always worth it. So Proverbs chapter 10 verse 9 says this, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Charles Swindoll, um, I've, I've quoted from him recently before. Uh, he, he wrote a book called Growing Deep in the Christian Life. And he tells about this guy that goes and picks up some, a, a bucket of chicken uh, with, with his date. So he goes, pick up a bucket of chicken, they get home. And they, they open it up, and it's not the chicken. It's actually the, the cash drawer they were getting ready to take and deposit at the bank, and they just got it swapped out with his chicken dinner, right? And so they look at it, and among other things, there's like over $800 in cash in this bucket. <clears throat> so right away, he just says, I got to go. So he, he goes back to the chicken place, walks in, puts, puts the bucket there, and he says, I'm sorry, there's been a horrible mistake, but you gave me uh, a bunch of cash instead of my chicken. The manager's like overwhelmed, like, this is the most honest person I've ever met. He goes, can, can you stay here? I want to get a picture. You're going to be in the newspaper. I mean, everybody's going to know how honest you are. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, um, the woman I was with is not my wife. I didn't want to be in the paper. So it's possible to be a little honest but not have integrity. Did you catch that? I mean, like, we got to be really careful, and there's all kinds of ways we can get in trouble. Listen to this, Proverbs 12, 13. The wicked are trapped 
by their own words, but the godly escape such trouble. Like they don't even get in that kind of trouble. I love the old living Bible. I don't know if you ever had one of those. It was kind of like squishy green. It was a dark green, the hardback one, but it was kind of squishy. It was kind of cool. The living Bible said it this way, lies will get any man into trouble. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Like Jeremy said, I'm not going to have you to raise your hand. I'm just not going to ask you to raise your hand if you know that that's true, right? Like we know, like lying gets us in trouble. Let me just give you a, a few different ways we, we tend to lie, especially in relationships that get us in trouble. Here's one, lying to protect. Now, what are we, what are we trying to protect? Most of the time we're trying to protect someone's feelings. In a relationship, we lie, so we're trying to protect their feelings, I know I mentioned Barry White, I mentioned Charles Swindoll. So for all of you younger ones, let me give you a Friends reference. See, some of you are like, oh, oh, I watched that show, I know what you're talking about. So Chandler is talking to Ross and Monica about a conversation he had with his, at that time, girlfriend, Janice. Yeah, I don't know if you remember Janice. Chandler Bing, yeah, that guy, that girl, right? So he's saying, um, here was the conversation. See where I went wrong. That's the idea, right? So he says, she's, she asked me this question. Do I look fat? And so he says, I looked at her. Ross goes, no, you don't ever look. It's just an impulse. As soon as they say, like, do I look fat? You say, no, you don't even have to look, right? Is she prettier than me? No. You don't look, right? So it's like, why, why would somebody do that? Whether they do actually look larger in that dress or that other person may be pretty, it's like we're trying to protect their feelings. Maybe we're trying to protect our, our schedule. Like one guy said, he goes, I, I was in this situation. And I was like, my, my wife came out. And she goes, how do I look? He goes, I wanted to be honest, but we were already 20 minutes late. Like he's trying to protect his schedule, right? So there's all kinds of things. Well, let me give you another example from our life. Early on, and I did ask permission for this one, early on in our marriage, my wife and I went down to uh, El Cajon where my parents lived at the time. And so I don't even, I think this was pre-kids. This is like pretty early on. And we went down, they were having dinner with him and my mom made this chicken and uh, broccoli casserole thing. And um, I'd had it before, I liked it. But I knew that my wife, my new wife, I knew that she was not a fan of broccoli. And she's matured over the years, and sometimes she has it, and it's okay, and she likes it. But at the time, she was like, I'm not a fan. And so my mom pulls out the casserole, and she goes, I made my chicken and broccoli. And I said, by the way, uh, Michelle doesn't really care for broccoli. And Michelle's like, oh, what are you doing? Like, like somehow wanting to protect my mom's feelings, she wasn't going to tell her that she didn't like broccoli. And you're like... Well, what's the big deal? And I said, do you want her to think that you love it and she makes it every single time we come down here? And she goes, ah, I guess you're right. See, sometimes, sometimes it's just so simple, right? But we're just trying to protect someone's feelings, but actually we're not being completely honest with them because we're trying to protect their feelings. Another reason is we, we, we lie to, to avoid trouble. I mean, we want to avoid getting in trouble. And this is probably a big one for us when we're kids. Right? Like, did you do that? No. Like, we immediately move out of that realm. We, we don't want to be in trouble, even though everybody knows we did it. Here, here's where we can actually get really good at this. And in fact, I've noticed that as kids get, you know, maybe kindergarten, first grade, second grade, when they get kind of in there, they, they, they pick up some other skills from their friends socially. And you can see, you can see them now learning even better how to do this. And what I mean is this. They, they learn how, we learn how to use truthful words without ever leaving a truthful impression of what actually happened. Okay, let me give you an example. Hey, so what did you do uh, yesterday before we got home? Oh, mom and dad, I, uh, I came home from school, I did my homework, and then I watched some TV. All true statements. But, but here's the bigger truth. After school, before I got home, I went by Joey's house. I know you don't like him, but we partied for a while. Then I got home. I did have a little bit of homework. It took me like 10 minutes. I finished that. And then I accessed some cable channels that I know I'm not supposed to, but I learned how to hack your parental controls. And so I got in there and watched TV until you got back. Okay, what they said the first time was all true, but it wasn't necessarily honest, was it? See, sometimes we just lie to, to avoid being in trouble. Here's another one. We, we lie out of habit. 
I don't know if you've ever caught yourself doing this. Like somebody asks something, you immediately just have a response. And you're like, that, that wasn't even the total truth. Like, do you ever wonder why you do that? Why, I do, why, why do we do that sometimes? Maybe it's just this, this need inside of us to impress someone or for someone to like us, whatever it is. I've, I've been around, I don't know the, the, the psychological way to say this, but I've been around compulsive liars. And after a while, you know that there is literally nothing that you can believe, even though they sound completely believable. The stories they tell, the things that they say, you're like, I don't know if, I just don't know if I can. It, it's natural. It, it seems effortless for them. And maybe, maybe you've seen people like that and you've experienced something like that too. Like my, my wife's a substitute teacher and uh, she's had some of your kids. <laughs> So I don't know whose kids this was, but no, she's, she said, you know, there's times it really kind of blows her away. Like somebody will, will do something in class. Let, let's say they throw something in the class or let's say they, they get out their phone and they're not supposed to have their phone. They do something and then she like, she sees them do it and she goes, Hey, can you put that away? Or can you stop doing that? Like I didn't do it, but, but I saw you. Yeah, but I didn't do it. It wasn't me, but I saw you, you know, but it wasn't me. And like, they will never give up on it. Like, I'm not going to quit. It's just like this habit that's formed because maybe because they don't want to be in trouble. They, they've just learned so instinctively how to do that. I do believe honesty is still the best policy. And sometimes we might get ourselves in trouble with honesty. We'll talk about that a little bit. But, but honesty is always going to be the best policy. One lady goes in to uh, pick up some, some chicken at the butcher shop on her way home. It's gotten some people coming over, and so she says, uh, uh, I, I need some chicken. So the, the butcher just reaches into the barrel, grabs, by the way, the only chicken he had left, throws it up on the scale, tells her how much it is, and she goes, oh, I need a little bit more than that. And so he takes it off the scale, throws it in the bucket. She goes, do you have any other ones? I says, well, he, it's the same one, by the way. You know, this one's about 12 ounces more. She thinks, she goes, you know what? Perfect. I'll take them both. See, if he would just been honest in the first place, maybe things would have been better, right? But here's where I think sometimes we think we're going to get into trouble. We, we call it too honest. You know what that means? Like, I don't want to be too honest. Like, we're really still kind of protect somebody's feelings. Being, being too honest even sounds like maybe it's going to make more of a withdrawal than a deposit in our love bank. If I, if I really come out and say what I'm feeling, it's going to cause more problems, and so I just don't say anything. Or, or what I do say is not really how I feel. Which, can I just tell you, is not totally fair to your spouse or to your parents or your kids or to your friends or, or even to your coworkers. When, you, when you're not completely honest with the way you feel about a situation and then you continue to hold that kind of feeling towards them because of what they're doing. Maybe, maybe it's just something that irritates. Maybe it's something that really hurt your feelings, but, but you never say anything. And so they, they do it again. They do it again. They do it again. And you, you kind of harbor something against them. It's not, it's not their fault. At that point, you had the opportunity to be honest, you, but you were afraid to be too honest. Like, too honest just means you, you come in, you know, guns blazing without love. But what have we said throughout the series? Speak the truth in love. You don't have to yell at them. You know, in fact, you might want to just kind of slow your pace down a little bit. Just kind of relax your tone a little bit and kind of have the conversation you need to have. Proverbs 11 verse 3 says this, the integrity of the honest keeps them on track. The deviousness of crooks brings them to ruin. Like true, true integrity, the kind of honesty that we're talking about is not just speaking truthful words, but it's like being an honest person, being, being authentic and real with our life. It needs to kind of come out in all different ways. Let me give you my, my favorite verse about all this this weekend. It's Ephesians 4.25. And we've been in the book of Proverbs and we've been in Ephesians a lot during this series, kind of bouncing back and forth. And this is going to be out of the message. It, it kind of expands this one verse and gives it a little bit more flavor. But listen to what it says. What this adds up to then is this. No more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other after all. When you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Remember what we said last week, when you hurt your spouse, you're, you're really hurting yourself because it's not just me, it's we. And so he's saying in the body of Christ, when we lie to somebody else, or maybe we, we don't tell them the truth in love, and we just kind of hold back. We don't let them know how, how deeply they wounded us or hurt us. And they, they have no clue because they were just having fun. They were just making a joke. But, 
but because we weren't honest with him. It's like we're, we're hurting the body. We're hurting the fellowship. We're hurting the relationship. We could probably argue about this until we're blue in the face, but I still think Michael Jordan is the best basketball player ever. I know Kobe and LeBron, you know, freak athletes that did amazing things, but I just, you know, maybe it's because of the era, you know, we watch these things in. I was just mesmerized by Michael Jordan, what he was able to do with that team. But I was also mesmerized by some things he said about honesty. When it came to his contract, and if you watch the documentary on Netflix, uh, they, they actually talk about this a little bit. Um, but there was, a, there was a point where, by far and away, the best player in the NBA, he was not even close to being one of the top paid players. But he never held out. He never tried to renegotiate his contract until it was over because to him that was dishonest. He says, I, I agreed to, to pay for that amount. Now, I know some of the people really quick when they hear this story, they're like, yeah, but he was making bagillions of dollars from Nike, right? But no, he had every right to say, I'm the best player. I need to have the best contract. But he never did that. And this is what he said. I have always honored my word. I went for security. I had six-year contracts, and I always honored them. People said I was underpaid, but when I signed on the dotted line, I gave my word. So the six years ends, you know, he, he renegotiates another contract. Well, three more years into it, now again, there's a lot of people not even close to the level he is that are paid far more than him. But he's like, nope, I'm going to wait for the end of the six years, and then we'll have that discussion. In fact, this is what he said, too. He said, if his kids saw their dad breaking a promise, how could he continue training them to keep their word? It's not just honesty. It's not just what we say. It's how we live our life. I know you can, you know, maybe find things in his life that weren't right. We could do it with any of us. But I just, I really, really appreciated what he said about this idea of integrity and honesty when it came to his contracts. So what I want to do tonight, it's this different kind of a message, but I want to give you five different ways we need to be honest in our relationships, kind of five categories, five areas in which we need to be honest in our relationships. For those of you, like we said last week, you're married. These things obviously apply, but these, these things are going to apply to all kinds of relationships. So whether you're married or not, you, you can get something out of this. Uh, in fact, uh, the, these five things are going to wrap it up for us. They're going to wrap up our series. But in all honesty, when I say the word wrap up, I don't mean I'm close to being done. <laughs> all right, here we go. Number one, I'm going to give you five of them. Number one, emotional honesty. We need to be honest about our emotions and what's going on you know, like in these relationships with our family, even maybe with people we work with, maybe with people that we're close to. We need to be honest with those emotions that are happening. In fact, when, like I said, when somebody maybe hurts our feelings because of something they said or the way they said it, it may have been intentional, may not have been, but it hurt our feelings and we don't tell them. And then it happens again and we don't tell them. Like now at, at this point, that, that problem is really ours. Like, we, we should be able to just say, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm going to give you a clue on how to do this in just a second. But, but we need to have, like, sometimes those difficult conversations. Like, remember what Jesus said, the truth will set you free? That, that applies to a lot of areas and especially applies to our relationships. And so we're going to speak the truth in love. When, when Michelle and I learned early on in our marriage was a thing called I messages. I don't know if you ever heard this in like a counseling setting or anything, but uh, we, we learned this and it was a huge help to us because we were two different people who now were married, living in the same house. We came from different families, different backgrounds, and now here we are together and we're having to learn how to truly communicate with each other. And so instead of saying, you really hurt my feelings, right? We learned I messages, meaning, here's, here's an example. I felt kind of put down the other day when we were with our friends and you told that, that kind of funny story about me, but you didn't really ask me if that was okay. Like just this, I, I felt this way. And, and I, I believe if we, if we slow down and we kind of say, this is how I felt about it. I do believe in most cases, the person who loves us is going to be listening and like, I, I had no idea that it did that to you, or that's how you reacted or felt. I'm, I'm sorry, right? But we need to start with, instead of pointing our finger and yelling, we need to start with saying, I, you know, I'm feeling this way, or I felt this way when this happened. And so just kind of slow down and begin with our feelings as we begin to discuss those things. But we've got to be honest when it comes to our emotions. Number two, we want to be historically 
honest, historically honest. I did some reading on this, and there was quite a debate about, especially for those who are married, how much they need to tell their, their new spouse now about their past. And he was saying, by the way, you don't have to tell your spouse about every stupid thing you did when you were in middle school. That's not what we're being, like, historically accurate. <laughs> but if you've been in past relationships, I th think it's fair to, like, share with them some of those things, even some of your failures in those things. So they kind of know some of the baggage that you're bringing into this relationship. It's, it's kind of that historical honesty. Here's some things that would probably be helpful for you to know, especially, like, those of you maybe have been divorced, and now you, maybe you're with somebody else, but you share kids with somebody else, like, you know, and you're all going to get together because it's, you know, eighth grade graduation or kindergarten graduation or it's a party in the park. I don't know. But you get together with all these different, you know, family members because there's a common child or common children involved. It's like, well, why did they do that? Well, uh, oh, by the way, I never told you that, you know. Like, we have to be kind of honest historically about some of the things that have happened in our life and, and what's going on. By, by the way, there's a whole other layer here. And our, and our staff is reading this book right now together. And this came up again today, but I really loved what we were talking about. Uh, but the idea is this, it's like it's being honest with ourselves about our history. And here's how, this is my takeaway from this, not really what we were talking about with our staff, but I just thought for this context, this might be helpful. The idea is that we, we need to be honest with ourselves about our history, meaning not, not that we live in our past, not that we're defined by our past. Listen to me carefully. We're not stuck there, but, but we can learn from it. Okay, we're not going to be defined by it. We're not going to be stuck there, but we can learn. We, we need to be honest with maybe sometimes why I, I feel or the, I react the way I react. And maybe it has to do with something back here, maybe the way I was raised or a previous relationship or some other work experience, whatever it was. Like, I need to be honest and then learn from those things and learn how to get better at those things. That, that's part of the self-honesty that I need to be doing. It, it helps me be, like, authentic and real and an honest person as a whole. Number three current honesty. Like, I'm going to be honesty, uh, honest about stuff like right now. Uh, I've shared this quote be with you before, but I'm going to give you more of the background of the quote first. Uh, Vanderbilt University has a pretty strict uh, code that is respected there for their honesty. And, and actually, students actually can call out other students if they hear about or know about cheating, and they have proof about that. And it, it's encouraged that they, it's like this code the whole university has. And Madison Surratt is the longtime dean uh, who passed away back in the 1970s, but he was a math professor as well as dean of education there. And he had this thing that he would say at the beginning of their trigonometry final every year. This is what he would say. Here it is. Today I'm going to give you two examinations, one in trigonometry and one in honesty. I hope you will pass them both, but if you must fail one, let it be trigonometry. For there are many good people in this world today who cannot pass an examination on trigonometry, and I am one of them. He says, but there are no good people in the world who cannot pass an examination on honesty. So how do, how do, how do we be currently like, honest with what's going on? Uh, for those of you married in, in particular, let me just give you three areas, and you can kind of relate this to other relationships as well. But if you're married in particular, let me just say it this way. You, you need to be honest with your personal schedule. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing if you both have, like, Apple stuff, like to, to share calendars. You, you know what's going, you know where they're at. You can share your locations on your phone. Those, those are all healthy things about just being open and honest with each other just about our life and our schedule. I think it's a healthy thing. Another thing is don't hide financial information. I mean, I know people who are married, have separate accounts and do all that kind of stuff. And, and if that's the, the way you choose to do it for a number of reasons, that's fine. But I hope that you are honest with each other about what's going on in those accounts because it's really we, not me. And so there, there are sometimes there are reasons why people have separate accounts. But man, don't let there be like hidden pockets and hidden accounts and hidden secrets when it comes to finances. Be very open about that stuff. And then the last thing um, I would say is, is be super honest about any inappropriate things that have happened. And here's what I mean by that. A few years back, um, I got an email from a lady who had attended our church 
with some very inappropriate pictures. So I immediately copied my wife and also copied somebody else on our staff. And then I sent that to the lady and I said, you are never to ever email me again. Now both my wife and this person on our staff know that you sent this to me. That's the last I heard of it. But there's part of us that maybe says, oh, I don't, I don't want my, my, my spouse, I don't want my, spy, my spouse to go crazy about something like that. I don't, I don't want them to get all hurt. I don't want them to like, you know what? If, if they get wind of it six months later, then they're going to have reason to distrust you. Like, just be upfront. Like, be honest with stuff that happens. If something happens at work, like you're at an office party or something like that, and like, well, that was inappropriate. Just tell your spouse. Like, be honest with that kind of stuff. Don't, don't let anything kind of get in there and grow and begin to build that wedge. That's part of current honesty. Don't let it be historical honesty. <laughs> then you have to come back later and say, oh, by the way, this happened two and a half years ago. I probably should have told you. And that's the wrong kind of historical honesty, right? No, be, be current with that kind of stuff. Number four, future honesty. Here's one that I, I think is just kind of interesting to me. Because in having conversations with people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase conversations that I've had with people. And it goes something like this. Well, if I tell him or if I tell her some of my plans now, or some of the things I want to do, that gives them too much time to squash it. I'm like, what? I've heard this more than once, by the way. Like, what? Yeah, like if I tell them what I want to do, like next month, they'll, they'll work out their work away to get away. It's like, what? I'm like, let's just slow down. Let me say it this way. It's, it's we, not me. And you can plan better together and you can pray better together and you can head into your future better together if like you do it together like so don't just like sneak up on them and it's like oh by the way tomorrow I've been planning this for 17 months tomorrow this is the first time you're hearing it tomorrow this is the plan like, what don't do that to your spouse right future honesty like let's work on these things together let's dream and plan and pray together about these kind of things and number five is just complete honesty. Complete honesty. There's an author named Willard Harley, and he says, you cripple your spouse when you fail to reveal the truth. You provide a map, listen to this, you provide a map that leads to nowhere. That's quite the picture. And some of these areas of, of honesty will totally stretch you or your spouse or your family members, or your friends. But man, if we can have people around us that we can be totally honest with, we're going to be better for it. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says this. Now that the worst is over, we're pleased we can report that we've come out of this with conscience and faith intact and can face the world. And even more importantly, face you with our heads held high. But it wasn't by any fancy footwork on our part. It was God who kept us focused on him uncompromised. The whole time I was working on this this week, I kept seeing the word compromise or uncompromised and all kinds of things. It could be articles. It could be something on a TV show. Compromised, uncompromised. And I'm like, that, that's a big part of this whole idea of integrity and honesty with our life. But he's saying, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't have to, you know, kind of finagle anything. We were just, we were honest. And God brought us through this, and we're doing fine. Um, some of you are huge. How many of you are baseball fans? Any baseball fans in here? All right, four, five. Wow, that's amazing. Some of you online, six, seven. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so a few baseball fans. Maybe, maybe you would remember this. I, I just looked it up again because I, I couldn't remember when it was, but it was 19 years ago. There was a guy named Ruben Rivera. He was uh, picked up by the Yankees, signed a million-dollar deal, I think he was like the cousin of the closer, uh, Manny Rivera. Uh, some of you might remember this, but it was, it was the end of, of, of spring training, and Yankees wound up cutting him and sending him on his way, even though he was probably going to be one of the best outfielders in Yankee history. He's like had those kinds of skills and abilities, fast, rocket arm, could catch, could hit, the whole thing. He was the whole thing, like a five-tool player. Million-dollar contract in hand, he steals, 
from the locker room, Derek Jeter's glove, and sells it to a memorabilia guy for $2,500. Later on, you know, he got picked up by another team and got to play in the, in the Major League Baseball for a few years. And he actually, like, the more he talked about it, the more it was the Yankees' fault. Like, it wasn't that big. He's, and he says, I didn't murder anyone. But the Yankees held fast. They're like, you know what? If we can't trust you, we don't need you on our team. I mean, that was, that was huge. He, he had a million. It wasn't for the money, was it? He had a million dollars. And he sold a glove he stole from Derek Jeter. Now, if I, if I would have stole the glove, I would have got more than $2,500. I mean, Derek Jeter? It's like, come on, man. So I, I was kind of taken back by that part of the story, too. No, seriously, like, unfortunately, that's pretty common in our culture today. John Maxwell is a, like, prolific writer about leadership and influence. And in a book called Becoming a Person of Influence, he says this, trust is an increasingly rare commodity th these days. People have become increasingly suspicious and skeptical. And then he quotes a guy named Bill Kynes who, who writes about, like, basically my generation. He says this, we thought we could trust the military, but then came Vietnam. We thought we could trust politicians, but then came Watergate. We thought we could trust engineers, and then came the Challenger disaster. We thought we could trust our broker, but then came Black Monday. We thought we could trust preachers, but then came the PTL and Jimmy Swaggerts. So who can I trust? And then Maxwell goes on to say, at one time, you could assume that others would trust you until you gave them a reason not to. But today, with most people, and just see if this isn't true, listen carefully. But today, with most people, you must prove your trustworthiness first that's what makes integrity so important. If you want to become a person of influence, trust comes from others only when you exemplify solid character. And I read that, and as soon as I finished the words, I thought of Daniel in the Bible. You remember the story of Daniel? Like he, he had risen to the top. This Jewish young man in a Babylonian world had risen to the top, and everybody was jealous of him, and everybody else wanted to get him out. And so they, they looked they, like, like they had like private investigators on him, trying to find any kind of dirt they could find on him. And it says they could find nothing wrong with his character, nothing wrong with the way he lived his life. He was a man of integrity. And they knew the only way they, they were going to get him was regarding his religion his faithfulness to God. And so they created a law against him praying to God. And what did he do? <laughs> as soon as he saw the law, he just went and prayed like normal. He, I'm going to be the same person no matter what the law says. I'm going to be the same person. But that kind of integrity came to mind as I read those words. But maybe you kind of like see that too. Like there's times when like you, you, you want to trust people. You like you give them enough rope and like if, if it, as long as they don't mess it up, like I'm going to continue to trust them. But it just seems like more and more now we've been hurt so many times. We've distanced ourselves now so many times that somebody's got to show us some integrity first before we're going to say, okay, I'm going to trust you. That, that makes relationships a little bit more difficult to get started. It does. But it just shows us, I think, how important this is. We're, we're obviously not just talking about marriages or families. Can we, can we take it where it needs to go? Our community this valley we call the San Jacinto Valley, they need to see integrity and character and honesty from people who say that they're Christians. I don't know if you guys saw this. This is not in my notes. I'm just going to go crazy for a minute. You ready? So I don't, I don't typically look at this stuff, but on one of the, the Facebook Hemet News things, I don't remember which one it was, they showed the guy that kind of busted in and, and harassed and assaulted one of the girl employees at, I think it was a Steve's. Oh, I think it was a Steve's. And I, I'm old, so I did this. You know, you know what that means? Like I made the picture bigger so I could see it? Because I thought, that, that can't be right. And I zoomed in. He had a red hat, but I was like, that, that can't be right. I zoomed in further. It said Jesus on his hat. I mean, I, I'm not saying he was a Christian. I, I really hope he wasn't from what they showed on the video. Maybe just somebody gave him a hat. Like, hey, you look like you could use a hat. Here you go. But I was just like, that, that image 
of a hat with Jesus coming in, busting his way into that restaurant. Remind me of the conversations I've had with employers in town who have honestly told me, and no joke, this is their words, I will never hire another Christian. And I am broken, like, why not? I didn't even want to ask, but I do. It's happened more than once. And they're like, because they cheat, they lie, they steal. Like, no, no wonder people are like, why should I give up like my Thursday night or my Sunday morning to go to church? I mean, everybody else is doing the same things. Like, they, they need to see a difference, friends. This is not just a message about our relationships and our family. This is a message that Jesus, Jesus needs to be clearly seen in us, in people of integrity, in our community, so that people will actually want to know more. It doesn't mean we always get it right. I, I think there's times when we're, we're going to blow it and we're just going to like say something we shouldn't have said or maybe react in a way we should. But let's just own that in the moment. Say, wow, I am so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I am so sorry. Instead of just justifying it or blaming it on somebody else, let's be people of integrity so, so he can be seen in us. Justin's going to sing part of this song we, we learned, and I, I want him to do this, but let me just pray for you for a moment, okay? Can we stand up? Let's do it this way. Let's stand up as we, as we end the series. God, take hold of us. We'll never be the people we need to be without your help. Like, like Ashley and Kaylin said tonight in their baptism, they just, they need you. We, we all do. So come into our life, God. Make the changes that need to happen so that, we can, so that we can shine brightly for you in this community and in our families. In the name of God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.